All right, let's get started with the first of the lectures on the progressive era. And when we're talking about the progressive era, we're talking about the period at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, where a bunch of things are coming together. A lot of stuff we've talked about in the, in the two earlier units uh, are, are this is actually kind of the the uh, the pinnacle of of what we talked about in there. So this is a, a with when we have this mass consumption and production, we have large urban growth, we have the second industrial revolution, and we have these social problems of poverty and uh, illiteracy and health issues and a lot of the the, the uh, uh, various and sundry problems that are that come with urbanization uh, are. Uh, still in the process of being addressed and it is this this progressive era and we call it the progressive era because it, it is a bunch of different groups uh, sometimes with competing loosely defined meanings sometimes it's very broad sometimes it's very narrow um, sometimes it's it you know you'll have groups working at odds with each other but essentially there is a recognition that there are problems and these are problems that need to be addressed and these are attempts to address them. And again, it comes down to, as I've said many times, or as I, I may have said, not said it too much, but I've said it many times over the years, is that really the part of, the, of this project is to define what it means to be free. What does it mean to be an American at the turn of the 20th century? Um, these notions of, of, of freedom, and, and I always use the, the national anthem, we all get up and, you know, land of the brave and home of the free, or land of the free and home of the brave, or whatever it is, I can never remember. But we all get all choked up, we all get all puffed up, we're all proud, we all cheer. I'm usually cheering because the, the person singing it just butchered it. But, um, but it affects all of us. And yet, what do those words mean? What does it mean to be in the land of the free? What do you mean by free? How do you define freedom? And one of the parts of the American experiment that I think is, is something that we should always be uh, reassessing is you know, we always claim we're free. We're the freest country in the, con in, in the world. Are we? And, and if so, in what ways? Are there ways in which other countries are freer than we are? And I would argue, yes, and over the course of the semester, I'll be pointing some of those out. So uh, just be prepared. As I said, as we come into the 20th century, it is the, it, really the big story is urbanization. The cities are growing like crazy, and they're growing very densely. And because they're growing so densely, it places a lot of uh, these issues uh, side by side. The juxtaposition between the extremes of wealth and poverty can be seen most clearly in these urban centers of New York and Chicago and Pittsburgh and, Pittsburgh and Boston and Philadelphia and, and all of these East Coast and Midwest cities, and, you know, Detroit, Indianapolis, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, uh, Minneapolis. These, st these cities are the perfect illustration of many of the issues that lead to uh, people seeking solutions. And some of the ways that these issues are spread to the rest of the country is through the arts and through media and through publishing. And so I'm going to mention a few. Number one, Lewis Hine. Lewis Hine was a photographer. Uh, he was probably our first photojournalist. He's probably our first urban photographer. Uh, this is a, a cityscape here on, on, the, on, the, uh, on your right-hand side of the screen. But in addition to these, and, and some of the photographs that you'll see as we talk about the different eras of, of, of American history, uh, we're talking about this era specifically, uh, our Heinz photographs, and I'll try to point them out as, as we do it. But he took pictures of people. He really began focusing his camera on the lives of people, not important people, regular people, people like you and me, factory workers and housewives and children and uh, all of whom were factory workers, uh, and uh, or all of whom could be factory workers, um, and uh, markets on the street, and uh, children playing, and all it, it, real life, and so those contrasts 
um, not are, are not only seen in the cities, but those these images go across the country and around the world, and it, it draws attention to these issues. Ida Tarbell wrote the history of the Standard Oil Company, of course, uh, owned by Rockefeller, a uh, huge monopoly, and, and she really talks about the abuses of um, both economic uh, abuses and uh, political abuses, because Standard Oil had, had their fingers into every piece of pie they could get it into. One of the most um, influential books of the time, and up until recently, almost every high school graduate had to have had uh, had to have read it at one point or another, is Upton Sinclair's *The Jungle*. And *The Jungle* has two parts to it. And the first part, of course, is the um, talking about the meatpacking industry in Chicago, talking about the safety conditions, how fingers get chopped off, how hair falls in, how rats fall in, uh, that, that, that it is really an unsanitary process, that the meat processing uh, business is, uh, you know, really just, they're, they're selling canned death. In addition, he talks about the, the uh, conditions in the factories that are, again, unhealthy, uh, non-safe, unsafe, I guess that's the word I want to use, uh, you know, fingers getting lobbed off, that type of thing. But the other part of the book, and the part that I think is actually more important, in, in, case, you're, in case you care, uh, is the part talking about the lives of the workers. Um, as is common in most of these uh, industrial cities that grew up, is you have the downtown, which is where the uh, large corporations are basically based. Close to that will be the actual factories. And then close to that will be the people that actually work there. Now, in the case of Chicago, you have the railroads all coming in. This is why the railroads all hub in Chicago is because that was how you got the beef and the pork to the processing plants. And so you bring them in at the stockyards, you take them from the stockyards to the, to the uh, packing sheds, and then you go from there, or packing houses, I guess they'd call them. And so the people who work there live close. And he describes the stench and the, the noxious fumes that, comes off, that come off of it, and just living around you know, the smell of rotting meat and uh, dried blood and just really the horrible conditions in which the, the, these workers live. But the city is also seen as a symbol of the modern world. It is exciting. It has noise and it has movement and it has color and it has electricity and it has trains and trams and buses and cars and horses and honking horns and peop vendors uh, calling out their wares and, and uh, carolers singing at Christmas time and etc. Uh, etc. Et it is a bustling, noisy, uh, uh, exciting place. There's never been anything like the modern 20th century city. And this is, is called Six O'Clock Winter. It's a 1912 uh, painting by John Sloan. Uh, he was considered to be part of the ash can school, ash can being trash can. We, I don't know how it went from being ash can to trash can, but that's how it, well, it used to be for ashes, and now we use it for trash. Uh, but the, uh, because he focused on everyday life, he focused on, not on presidents, he didn't focus on senators, he didn't focus on great battles, he didn't focus on, on uh, great landscapes. His landscape was the city and his subject was people. And I credit that in, 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 in several ways to uh, improving uh, technologies in photography. Um, motion picture actually starts in the 1890s, is where you know, most people become aware of it. Um, the uh, uh, photography has improved where you no longer need those, those 90 second to five minute exposures. Uh, still not, can't take fast candids, but you, you, they're much less formal, much less stilted, much less staid. And so while in Paris, for example, the Impressionists are moving away from the big subjects and looking at people, so are the Americans. Because France is going through exactly the same thing at the time. And so you get Degas and Renoir and all those people at the same time as the Ashcan uh, painters over here. They're looking at urban life in Europe. These guys are looking at urban life here in the United States. America. At the beginning of the century, 
20 million people are searching for their fortune. Progress means for them leaving the old, tired Europe. They immigrate. So here is a photograph from about right, right around 1900. This is Mulberry Street. If you read the uh, It Happened One Day on Mulberry Street from Dr. Seuss, this is actually the same Mulberry Street that we're talking about. This is in, in New York's Lower East Side, and it is a, uh, an immigrant community. Uh, one of the things that happens as migrants come to the United States, and this is true of migrants just about everywhere, they follow pretty much the same patterns. Um, they utilize what we refer to as uh, family stem migration. Uh, usually a member of a family will make a trip to the new country, uh, in this case the United States, and, um, and become established. Uh, normally he will look for uh, people from the same region that he's from, maybe from the same country. Uh, very often find, uh, may know someone from his or her own village or the city that they came from, and they'll get in touch with them, and then they'll find a place to live that's close to that and find a place to work that's close to that. And then once they become established, then they bring the family over. Well, what happens then is that, that because people are, are moving into proximity one with another, we end up with uh, ethnic enclaves. And these are actually are, are beneficial in many ways in that they allow uh, within those enclaves, those little neighborhoods, uh, really kind of a, a, an incubator for these immigrants. Uh, they're able to use their, their own languages. Um, there are uh, merchants that cater to them, whether it's the delicatessens for the Germans or uh, specialty shops for the Italians or whatever group it is that we're talking about. A uh, neighborhood I used to live in in, in Cleveland was a hung Hungarian neighborhood historically. Um, all of the East Coast cities have all of these little tiny... You know, we see it here in, on the West Coast. We see it with um, you know, San Francisco has its Chinatown, Los Angeles has its Chinatown, and it has its Jewish neighborhoods, and it has its, its little Tokyo, and its little Korea, and um, uh, Germantown in, in uh, some of the cities. So you see the, these ethnic enclaves grow up. And then these are often the places that people uh, come out of as they're, they're moving from being immigrant in the next generation into being uh, uh, fully assimilated. And remember, there's no immigration law at this point. If you can get here, you become a resident. Once you're a resident, you can become a citizen. And so um, for those of us whose families have been here since before 1921, uh, all of us, all of them just came here and got in, and there was no such thing as an illegal alien. Uh, that designation doesn't happen until 1921 22 when we do our first temporary and then in 22 our permanent uh, or our, our first long term uh, immigration reform. And that's really the first time that, that we have any immigration laws at all, except for the Chinese Exclusionary Act of 1882, 1892, and 1902, um, uh, which, which we'll kind of skim over a little bit here. So I want you to look at this photograph. I know you've been staring at it while I've been rambling, but um, this is common. This is, is uh, number one, it's a rare photo. This is not a tinted photograph. This is a rare color photograph from around 1900, uh, some early technology. And uh, that's one reason why it's not as clear as it could be. But you can see really lots of stuff about life here. Running right down the middle of the screen is, is the street. That is Mulberry Street. But as you can see, just off of the sidewalk, running down the left-hand side of the street, uh, are barrows. These are wagons, small wagons, filled with produce, fruits and vegetables and, and uh, other, other types of goods. Not always uh, food. Sometimes they'll have uh, dry goods and, and uh, other things, pots and pans and uh, clothing, cloth, all kinds of things. Uh, on the other side of the street, uh, I think that's just regular traffic going through there, but you can see that all of the traffic at this particular point is horse-drawn. Uh, that means that while you're standing there buying your uh, potatoes, uh, the horse behind you is, is urinating in the street or taking a crap, and hopefully not much of it splashes up against you. That's why, uh, gentlemen, I'm sure your mother taught you that, that, that you properly walk on the outside of the sidewalk. Well, you know, if you're walking with a woman on down the street, a gentleman walks on the outside because you don't want horse shit all over your girlfriend. Um, I don't know if your mother taught you that or not. Mine did. 
You know, it, it, I don't even think she knew why, but she taught me I was supposed to walk on the outside because that's where gentlemen did. Uh, so you see the, the, uh, the fil- I mean, horses are filthy. Uh, they're, they're wonderful animals, but they are, they're dumb, but they're wonderful, but they're filthy. And um, this is the primary mode of transportation. Cars were sold as a clean alternative uh, to the horse. Um, in addition, if you look on either side, you see that there are shops along either side of the street here. And above those shops in the second, third, and, and sometimes fourth floors, uh, that's where all these people live. The shop owners, the local residents, they all live above the shops down on the, on the streets. And this is you know, tightly, uh, uh, very, very densely populated cities. This is the, the pattern. Shops on the bottom and then floors of, of people above them. And um, there's no plumbing. There's no indoor plumbing. There's no running water, and there are no flush toilets. Uh, you have to go to the bathroom. You run down four flights of stairs, and you make a trip to the to the outhouse. Uh, most of the outhouses were just, uh, you know, basically a little little uh, building built over a hole in the ground. Uh, some of them, uh, in some cities, uh, you couldn't actually put the waste in the ground. It was actually captured in a container below the where you sat. Uh, and then it was uh, nightly, uh, what were called the, the night soil men, would come through and um, collect the human waste. And then, and they still do this in some parts of the world. In parts of Africa and parts of Asia, they still, because they don't have plumbing. Uh, they don't have sewage plumbing. And so then you collect the waste and then you take it out of the city, hopefully, uh, to uh, a place where it's processed and turned into uh, manure. Uh, it actually is quite a, a uh, far more efficient than, in some respects than the way we do it now. But um, so y- you can imagine this is, like I said, it's noisy. It stinks. It is a, 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 an interesting place to be. Now, look in the very center, the lower center portion of the screen, the, sec- the lowest half right in the center. And you'll see that there are large numbers of children there. Well, there's no such thing as compulsory education in 1900. Um, the um, basically these are kids that um, either could be working, and many of them probably do already work in factories. Uh, but there's no edu- there's no compulsory education that won't happen until um, it, it'll start in the 20s and 30s. But by the time we get to the 30s, everybody every kid goes to school and thinks it's natural. But as we get up to that period, um, it it's not a done deal. If you could afford to send your children to to private schools, you did. If you didn't. Uh, it was kind of up to the city or the county or the state whether or not there was even education available. Here in California, it, it, the state would provide funds for the education of white children. Um, so the way it worked out was you would have an election by the parents of white children in a town. And they could elect one of three types of schools that the California, state of California would pay for. Uh, first of all, is whites only. Uh, the white parents could make the decision that the school would be exclusive to white children. Again, it's not compulsory yet either. It's all voluntary. Second, the, uh, the, the parents could vote that if they, that to have not only the exclusive white school, but then they could also have what was referred to as a colored school, and that was where the Hispanic, Asian, and African American children went. And then the third option would be to have an integrated school. So here in California, at the turn of the century, we have uh, really a hodgepodge. Some places are fully integrated. Some places have no education for non-white students. Others have uh, separate and not always equal uh, schools. So for example, in 1892, uh, I believe the name was Charles. Last name is Weisinger, W-Y-S-I-N-G-E-R, no relation. And that's a completely different name, but people get them sometimes confused. But I think it's Weisinger versus Peterson. I believe it's Peterson. Peterson was the uh, principal of the Visalia uh, Visalia Elementary School. And this young man, Mr. Weisinger, wished to go to the real school, not the Visalia Colored School, which was held in a packing shed on the the outskirts of town where the uh, non-white students attended and the single instructor that they had was a former slave who could read and write a little and do some figuring. 
And Mr. Weisinger was a very bright young man, and he wanted a real education. And so he uh, sued and took it all the way to the California Supreme Court. And in 1892, it was ruled that separate was not equal and that, that communities had to provide for all children if they wished to go. And so with the exception of a couple of school districts along the Mexico-California border where they did allow for segregation based on language requirements, not race or ethnicity, but only the language. Um, the rest of the state, six, 70 years before, or 60 years before uh, Brown v. Board of Education, had outlawed separate but equal. What you're looking at is a house. This is the house of Cornelius Vanderbilt III. Uh, this is on New York City's Fifth Avenue. And it's supposed to look like a French uh, chateau. Uh, today, there is a department store on this site, but this was a house. And if you can see my mouse cursor, uh, that is one edge of the house, the back, is actually the back corner. And where I'm marking right now, if you can see it, is uh, where the other corner is. So a third of this photograph is one house. And as I said, the, the, the cities are the prime example of these uh, discrepancies of uh, wealth and poverty. Um, you just saw how many people live. Now you see a house with probably five residents and, and a third of a staff of 30. This is also the period of, of, of our history with, that, we, that is kind of the, the pinnacle of, of our immigration. Um, immigrants are coming here for a variety of reasons, but they are, are primarily coming here for opportunities. We need these immigrants actually at this point because this is the, the really the, the expansion of the second uh, uh, industrial revolution. And we need these, we need bodies, we need workers. And so um, we're welcoming, welp welcoming up to 12 new Americans a minute according to this. So this is, is uh, from 1815 to 1914. So this is that, that big wave from, uh, this, this ends about the time we're talking about. Um, 35 million from the Atlantic come over to the Americas. Another 8 million going to South America. Uh, it's from the Americas out of that 35 million and out of, out of South America, 7 million return. Um, but there also is a million coming from the Dutch East Indies, from Siam, from India, from parts of China. They're coming over uh, in, in large numbers as well, significantly smaller, and they're only coming to the West Coast, um, but they are coming. And um, basically, I'll just give you a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to study the map. So this is an Italian family on a ferry boat leaving Ellis Island in 1905. Uh, this is one of Lewis Hines' photographs. Uh, these guys had just gotten through the, the inspection process, and they are about to finally set foot on the mainland of North America. Here in 1912 is a Mexican immigrant coming across from Mexico into Southern California, um, and uh, he's got his wagon and his burro, and he's coming to be an American. As part of the urban age, we also are really establishing a mass consumption society. And we do this through a variety of mechanisms, things that today would seem completely normal, but that were new at the time. And uh, we'll start, first of all, with the department store. Now, most of us are familiar with the department store, whether it's Walmart or Macy's. It is a big box, and in that box are a lot of little departments, hence the name of the department store. And uh, each of those departments echoes, or it did at the time, echoed um, smaller shops, boutique shops, that would have been um, uh, common in the, at the turn of the century. So, for example, at the time, if you wanted to buy gloves, you went to a, a glove store. If you wanted to buy an umbrella, you went to an umbrella store. You didn't go to a big store and buy both. Um, you went to a haberdasher for a hat. 
you went to a uh, tailor or a men's clothing store for men's clothing, women's store for women's clothing. Uh, they were all, all of these stores would be separate. Even when we talk about things like groceries, um, you would have a dry goods uh, shop that would have things that didn't spoil. You'd have a, uh, you'd have the carts selling produce. You'd have a butcher shop, maybe also a, a butcher uh, cart, um, a cheese cart or a cheese shop. Uh, food was was sold separately. You bought the dairy from the dairyman. You bought you know, all of these things from individuals. Really putting them all together, the supermarket. That's a, a mid. Uh, it starts in the, the like 1940s. We really begin having the supermarkets, but um, this I, this notion of taking all these individual shops and putting them under a single roof uh, is really an innovative part of this particular part of uh, of our history. And in, in comparison, about a decade or so ago, I was in um, Eastern Europe. I was in uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia and um, uh, Germany and Austria and um, Hungary. And uh, in both in Hungary and in um, uh, Czech, I went into a quote-unquote department store. And these actually were separate shops inside the big building. Uh, you had to pay at each register. Uh, and that was common in the Eastern Bloc right through uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and it, it, it's kind of stuck in some of those places. Whereas here, maybe, maybe you have a cash register, but you can pay for something you bought on the other side of the store. There, they've put the stores in together, but they have yet to integrate, um, in, in many places, the, uh, the, the, the final purchasing. So you're actually shopping in separate little stores, uh, which, which I think really clearly illustrates how a department store functions. The uh, next thing we're talking about is, is neighborhood chain stores. And these will start with things like Woolworths and Ace uh, Hardware, Coast-to-Coast uh, -coast Hardware. These are basically franchise, uh, but they are part of chains. And so what you get is you get the benefit of national branding. And this is really the period in our history when we start having national media between newspapers and magazines, um, the, the, we, you can advertise, you can begin to start focusing on brand awareness. And so you can go to the Joe Schmo, Schmo shop, which is just a, a, you know, owned by a local guy, and buy a no-brand something, or you can go to the Coast-to-Coast uh, -coast Hardware where you get one of their guaranteed tools that you can bring back if it breaks, and you have, you, you know, there's a, a company that stands behind it, even though it's still owned by the local entrepreneur. The, the two stores are, are owned in the same fashion, except one is buying uh, usually much cheaper because he's buying as part of this big chain of stores. Um, he buys uh, the goods from the chain itself, and the other guy is having to buy from a variety of wholesalers and, and tries to, to compete that way. And the third thing that we see at this point is an extension of the department store, and that is retail mail order houses. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I buy 80, probably 50% of all the stuff I actually buy. I, I buy on Amazon, and, and Amazon is like a, a bittersweet... Um, uh, kind of a, a bittersweet dominatrix as far as I'm concerned. I hate the fact that it puts m tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Uh, but I love the fact that I can order it and it'll be at my house tomorrow. Um, but that was actually uh, common as we have the turn of the century and right up into the 1950s and 60s. Actually, even into the 70s. Um, for years, I lived in uh, small towns in the Midwest. And for four years, I lived in a, a town, and I was a, a, a young child. Uh, I lived in a small town of 167 people, and it was eight miles away from the nearest town, and my mother didn't have a car. It was just my mother and me, and she didn't drive, and so um, we didn't get to town very often. In our little town, there was a grocery store, and there was a post office, and there was a gas station, and there was a cafe with eight stools that, that if uh, they got a customer, they'd fire up the grill. But uh, there wasn't a big department store. Now, there was a J.C. Penney's eight miles away, but like I said, we didn't drive. And so um, 
we bought everything mail order, everything mail order. The Sears catalog, Sears and Roebuck, which was the biggest of these department stores, or I mean, the biggest of these uh, retail mail order houses. They didn't have stores. Sears actually fell apart and went downhill when they started focusing on their retail stores rather than their, their mail order uh, business. Had they continued, they were what, uh, they were up through about the 1970s uh, what Amazon is today for most people. Uh, you would get four uh, large catalogs a year, the most important one of course being the Wish Book, which was the Christmas book. You would get that in August and I don't know, we would sit down, I would go sit down, I'd go through Mark every one of the toys I wanted. All of my school clothes came from there. Uh, we would order school clothes in uh, July for the beginning of the year and they were always two sizes too big and then uh, by the time Christmas came around we would have another big package that came in that would get me through the rest of the year and um, that was how as I was growing up that's how we shopped and that was uh, what this did at the turn of the century was it really allowed for um, national distribution of products with, where because they're cheap they're mass produced they're relatively cheap compared to to um, if those same items have been made by hand and they're readily available everywhere. In addition to that, uh, Sears did a couple of really smart things. One of the things that it did initially was it printed all of its catalogs on soft newsprint paper as opposed to shiny glossy paper. Because slick glossy paper hurts when you wipe your butt with it but the soft stuff you can kind of soften it up a little bit and uh, you know crinkle it up a little bit and soften it and so what people would do is they would take the Sears catalog out to the outhouse and because I mean toilet paper wasn't induced, introduced until the 1920s so uh, prior to that you used all kinds of things you used corn cobs that were, were soaking in, in lye and water so they would be soft like a brush. You use that to wipe your butt. Um, different, different societies throughout human history have used everything from wet stones to corn uh, cobs, corn husks, cloth, you name it, leaves, all kinds of things. Uh, wiping your butt is, is something that society has found hundreds of ways to do. And one of the ways to do it was with the Sears and Roebuck catalog. That meant that while you're sitting on the pot out in the outhouse, you got reading material. And again, you're reading the ads for all of these wonderful products that you want to buy. And at the same time, then you can pull a page out and, and, uh, and take care of business. And the combination of the trains, right? By the, by the time we get to the 1870s, we have connected the entire nation uh, with railroads. Um, and so you, you get through these department stores, the neighborhood chain stores, and these, real or, the, these retail mail order houses. Basically, anyone everywhere can have the benefits of, of any product that, that exists out there. Um, you can live a very sophisticated life in Glenham, South Dakota, population 167, or you can live it in, in uh, Manhattan if you wish to. Another thing that happens really, and this is an outgrowth of the urban age, is um, leisure activities that are not geared to the rich. Prior to this particular period in our history, if you wanted, to, if you were wealthy enough, you could go off to resorts, you could go off to, uh, you could take a, a, an ocean cruise, uh, you could go to exclusive um, summer homes in, in Kennebunkport and various and sundry other coastal cities. Uh, but if you were poor, uh, there really wasn't anything for you. But as we come into the 20th century, we start to see the rise of, of a few things. Uh, Coney Island, amusement parks. Uh, here in Fresno, we have what was called Zapps Park, which was one of the very first water parks. Can you imagine a wooden water slide? Well, there was one at Zapps Park. Uh, but Zapps Park had swimming pools. It had uh, water slides and other water uh, uh, activities. Uh, you could also rent horses. Uh, and if you want to know where that is, uh, if, here on, if, you're, if you're sitting on campus or you know where city, Fresno City Campus is, go south of here about a mile. Uh, there's an, on Blackstone, there's now an elementary school and a little bar on the corner that's called Zapps Park. And that bar is across the street from where Zapps Park was. There's a mural of Zapps Park uh, painted at the school. So if your children went there or you went there as a child, uh, you might know about it. The rest of the city probably has forgotten about it. But this is the beginning of amusement parks. These are, and these are cheap entertainments. These are set up for poor people to go to 
because they realize a nickel from a bunch of people is more than a dollar from a few. And we also get, this also gives the rise to the theaters, not uh, high-end theater, not high drama, not even musicals, uh, the types of things that run on Broadway now, but theaters open with variety acts running from 10 in the morning till sometimes 2 in the morning, uh, sometimes running 24-7 in the larger cities where uh, you have comedians and jugglers and dog acts and, and, and singers and, and, and uh, maybe a, a scene from a, a Shakespearean play followed by uh, a, a comedy duet or something. Just a whole variety of issues. And we called it uh, initially vaudeville. Uh, they called it Music Hall in, in uh, Great Britain. Music Hall continued in Great Britain right up into the 1960s. It died out here probably in the, the 19, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, but it, 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 is, it comes of age here in the United States around this time. And again, it is, it is popular entertainment. It is cheap entertainment. Dance halls were another form of this. A lot of these uh, migrants, as I mentioned earlier, talking about family stem migration, uh, a lot of these... Uh, uh, new immigrants are young single males and so for a dime a dance they could go to a dance hall and they could buy a, a strip of tickets and then go up and hand the ticket to a girl who was a, an employee there and uh, dance until the song ended and then uh, find another girl or maybe the same girl with another coupon but but you didn't have to even speak the, the language you could go and you could find a pretty girl to dance with um, for for a dime a dance and um, it, it was uh, again much uh, it was geared to a poorer urban working class uh, clientele as opposed to uh, the Vanderbilts and then the, the great level of course is is movies um, and initially started out as a Nickelodeon. For a nickel, you could get in and, and, and you could watch a, f a few silent movies. By the time we get to the late 20s and the early 30s, we're building these huge palaces, but we're still just charging a nickel apiece. And, I mean, it was still, I was paying, as a kid at age 10, I was still paying for a Saturday matinee. I was still paying a quarter when I was, when I was little. Um, I know, I mean, you wouldn't think about doing that now, but, uh, but they were, these were mass consumption. This was mass production, uh, as, as urban and industrial as you can get. And uh, again, geared to uh, the common people. Now, what made movies such a great leveler was they were silent. And many of our immigrants, whether they were from Asia on the West Coast or from Eastern, Euro Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, or, or Ireland and, and other parts of Northern Europe, um, the, you know, they don't need to speak English. Uh, the, especially in, the, in like the comedies. The comedies are all physical. They're all slapstick. As Charlie Chaplin said, you know, that, that the one thing that every good movie, movie needed was a good kick in the arse. And so you don't need to be able to speak English to realize the guy just got a pie in his face or, or got kicked in the ass. It's funny. Um, even the dramas, the, the, you know, 80% of it is done without any title cards, and uh, you can get through it. You can just kind of follow the story as, you, as you're watching it. Um, and, and then to make movies in multiple languages, all you had to do was swap the title cards out. So you could produce a movie in English. Uh, often they produced silence with actors that didn't speak the same languages. Uh, they would, would have enough of the scenario, they'd know what was going on, or they might, might have very, very heavy accents. But because you're not recording it, you're just, you're just recording the emotions, the emoting. Uh, it doesn't matter. And so um, what you would do if you want to make a Spanish language version of a movie is you would just take out the English title cards and put in a version in Spanish or Italian or French or German. And this is what made the, the, the movie industry in the 19 teens and 20s universal. Our films sold all over the world because uh, it didn't matter. And, and we bought films from Europe as well and, and, and other places. So uh, movies initially were very easily to be international, but they also were very good for immigrant populations because you didn't need to speak the language to understand the comedy. So this is an early department store. In fact, uh, the J.C. Penney building downtown still, um, last time I looked in it, still looked a lot like this. Um, there was a shop in Porterville when I lived there in, in, uh, years ago when I was in radio and then also years before that when I was in high school. Um, it was called Bullard's. It was downtown and it was still set up like this. It had these little baskets. Let's see if I can move my, there we go. See these little baskets here. Uh, these little baskets um, could drop down 
and the clerk at her department, right? So this is a, a uh, looks like ladies clothing or something here. Um, and then this looks like, um, I'm not sure what that looks like. Cloth. Yeah, this is this is cloth. cloth. This is men's wear over here. So different departments. And what they would do is they would, would uh, get the product out and they would drop the pertinent information for the purchase, including the customer's name, into here, then pull a cord and it would go flying back up to here, which is the offices where they would actually put the receipts, where they would actually put the purchases together. And then that would all be done through uh, a register somewhere where you would pay to get out of there. But this is how the departments were set up, each one separate with a person working at it. Now notice that you don't do the shopping here. You go up to a clerk. You ask that clerk for such and so, and then he or she would show you what it is. Now, we're always hearing about, oh, computers took away this person's job, automation took away this person's job, outsourcing took away this person's job. Understand that part of the 20th and 21st century is that whatever job you have is probably going to be replaced sometime in your lifetime by either automation or by outsourcing. Two years ago, McDonald's agreed to up their minimum wage to $15. The same month, they rolled out self-help kiosks so that you don't need to hire anybody at a McDonald's. Uh, not, in the, not, not for the front, anyway. You can just push a couple of buttons on a touch screen and your burger comes out. Department stores used to have dozens and dozens of clerks. And they were, you couldn't, and, and, and even grocery stores and dry goods stores, all of them, you didn't go shopping. You went and you gave your list uh, or you went and you talked to people. You'd look around, talk, and ask to see and try on, and, and you would do all of the, the hands on, but then uh, probably didn't even carry your groceries home. Somebody probably took it. But understand that, that these jobs don't exist anymore. Coal jobs don't exist that much anymore because we don't use coal very much. Um, the photo mat, which was a place that used to process film when cameras still had film in them, um, those jobs are never going to come back. I was a disc jockey for, for years and years and years. Now with automation, uh, you know, two guys can run 15 stations 24-7 if, if, if you keep on top of it. Um, those jobs just don't exist because they've been replaced by, by either technology or by different economic models. And so this is, uh, like I said, this is an early example of a department store, a lot of people employed, um, huge technology like the little baskets. Um, now all of that stuff's done with registers and, the, and you get to do the shopping. Uh, I mean, even when I was a kid, you never pumped your own gas. Uh, it was always pumped by a guy in a clean uniform with a little cap and a little name tag on it. And he would come out and wash your windows, check your oil, check the tires, pump it full of gas. That was, that was common. That was, that was the only thing there was. Then in the 70s, they began self-pumping, and you got it for cheaper. So there was a full-service price and a, a self-service price. Now there's no such thing as full-service. Um, Oregon requires... Uh, that they still offer f uh, full service, uh, again, in a way to keep jobs. Um, that's just the way that our, our culture and our technologies change. One of the first and most successful chains, and I was sad to see it die in the 90s, um, it pretty much died here in the 90s. It, it lasted in Europe. Uh, its European branches still continued for a few years after that but was F.W. Woolworth. And F.W. Woolworth was the granddaddy of the five and dine, the, the, the discount store. We didn't call them discount stores. Um, you know, we have those now, Dollar Trees and things like that. But F.W. Woolworth was a, usually it just said Woolworth, but later it'll just say Woolworths, but this, this is an old sign, um, was in every downtown. It was, it had everything. Almost all the stores were set up exactly the same way. It was uh, every apartment uh, dweller's dream because you could go in there and in a hurry pick up shower curtain and, and, and rings. For years, that was the only place I ever knew you could buy shower curtain rings. Um, yeah, pick up uh, maybe a, a, a flannel shirt and some uh, detergent and just a few you know, things. It was usually small selection, a little bit of everything and all under one roof. The other thing that they had was that every one of these, because remember, they're in the middle of downtown in almost every city in the country, um, and 
one wall, usually the one that would be on your left in this picture, uh, all running the full length of the store would be a, um, a lunch counter. And they would cater to, they would open early and cater to businessmen's breakfasts and then shoppers' uh, brunches and pieces of pie and business people's lunches and then uh, shoppers in the afternoon and evening. And it was, you could get sandwiches, you could get burgers, you could get fries, you could get pie and coffee, cake, donuts, different things like that. And so it was just a, a place to pull up to the counter and, and have a quick a quick bite to eat. One of my favorite things as a kid of going to Woolworths was going to sitting at the counter because we always sat at booths. My mother was not one who sat at the counter. It was uh, uh, if, if a booth was available, the counter was never an option. So going to Woolworths was kind of fun because I could sit on the stool and spin. But um, there was a whole series of these. There was Woolworths, there was Coronet stores, there was uh, National Bell's Hess, I think, believe. They, they were more like Sears than, than uh, uh, than Woolworths. Um, uh, ben Franklin was another one. That was a, a five and dime. There were a number of these uh, chains that were these discount stores before they were discount stores, but they were chains. They were um, uh, department, little mini department stores, and they were everywhere. And as I mentioned, Sears and Roebuck was um, really the the supplier of uh, the world until um, until they started focusing on retail stores and really destroyed their own business. Uh, this is the, the the images I'm about to show you are from the catalog from 1900, um, and uh, you'll get a kick out of some of these. I hope. So here you can see that they're advertising. These are not high end items. I mean, there are some higher end, and they, and and one thing about the successful mail order houses at the time was they would have uh, basically three or four pricing levels. They would have, you know, something everybody could afford, something that was a little nicer, that cost a little bit more, something that was the mainstream, main line item, and then a high-end item or, or, or high-end group of items. And here you see dresses for women. Uh, these would be the latest fashions. Um, often before things like Sears existed, women would buy McCall's magazine, which had um, patterns in it. They would take those patterns, or even they'd just take the drawings, the, pa the pictures sometimes, and they would take them to seamstresses, and seamstresses would build them those fashions. Now for just a couple of bucks, you know, the most expensive dress on this is $4.25, which is a lot of money. That's a week, two weeks salary for a lot of people. Uh, but anywhere from a dollar ninety to to a uh, little over four bucks uh, to buy the latest fashions, and so you can be out in the the prairie where I grew up uh, and be just as fashionable as as the ladies on on Fifth Avenue. Kenmore appliances have been around for a long, long time. Of course, these are Acme, but uh, Kenmore will come out of these. Um, this is one of the few places you could order things like this, and so you could, you weren't, you weren't, but the nice thing about it, and the same thing with like Amazon today, is that you weren't stuck with the one model that your local uh, supplier had. You could go in and you could get just what you wanted, different, you can see all these different sizes and different, uh, uh, some of them come with um, uh, water heaters attached, some of them don't, there's, there's a whole variety, you can, you can basically uh, construct the, um, kitchen stove that you want here. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is the Harris 20th Century Railroad Attachment. And um, basically, roads at the, at the turn of the century sucked. Most of them were gravel. Uh, very few paved roads. When the, the, the first cars hit uh, the market in the 19 uh, teens and 20s, when the Model Ford hit the market in the, in the 20s, uh, teens and 20s, in England, for example, there was 75 miles of paved road. That was it. Um, so we've come a long way just in, in the amount of the miles of paved road. And so if you wanted to get around on a bicycle outside of the major cities, one of the easiest ways to do it was to follow the railroad tracks. Well, right along the edge of the tracks, it's all big gravel. And so you wanted something smooth to ride on, ride on the rails. Uh, you, hopefully they'll, you'll hear the whistle when the train comes up behind you or in front of you. And this particular device hooked to your bicycle and was set up for a standard width and so your wheels would sit on one side and then you had this other guide wheel on the other side and then you just got on and pedaled and like I said hopefully you wouldn't run into a, a, a train coming one way or the other. There is an, a, a, a the, the number two flyer attachment which is almost it was over two dollars more 
um, actually had additional wheels in front of and in behind your, your original bike wheels. And it had the little um, uh, the walls so that, that that would keep you on the, the, uh, the rail. Although it wasn't really necessary unless you needed it to, um, uh, you know, you had a lot of corners you were going around. Uh, did it work? Yeah. Did they sell a lot of them? Who knows? I've never seen pictures of anyone using one. I've never seen a movie of anyone using one. Uh, but I just think it's one of the greatest things uh, that, that Sears probably ever sold. And one of the things that, that Sears sold, that they sold hundreds of thousands of, uh, were houses. Um, not plans, but whole houses. Um, these were prefab. They, every board was cut and labeled. Uh, they would be delivered to the job site, um, basically flat packed and all set up. These were the IKEA of houses. Everything you needed, every nail, every shingle, every piece of pipe, every piece of wire, every uh, piece of clabbered, everything was there and cut and numbered and ready for assembly. And um, with just basic carpentry skills, you could build these houses yourself. And they were really, really popular in uh, places throughout the Midwest. Much of, I believe it's, it's um, much of Akron, Ohio, like something like 30% um, of all the homes in Akron, Ohio are former Sears homes. Uh, Montgomery Wards, which is another mail order house, uh, they sold houses. And there was also a, a, another company called Craftsman, no relation to Sears, that um, also built houses and, and, and sold them. And um, this layout looks so familiar to me because I actually grew up in houses that, that are similar to this. The house I lived in in Cleveland uh, in the 1990s uh, was a Sears house. If you went up into the attic and you looked at the boards, you could see the numbers where they, where they were. And, and the beauty of it, all the lumber was just so clean and so uh, beautifully cut. It was you know, no cutting on the job site. It was just basically take it and assemble it. Or you could contract for uh, a contractor to build it. Like I said, entire neighborhoods in some cities uh, were built using these because contractors would buy them up in, in huge lots and just go down the street one by one by one and just do like we do today with, with tract homes. But they would just build uh, the same houses down uh, for, for entire neighborhoods, customizing each one with different paint or something like that, but basically uh, much like they do today. Um, it was a very economical and very efficient and very fast way to build uh, homes prior to many of the modern materials like uh, wallboard. Wallboard didn't exist. It all, has to all be plastered by hand. And so the, the more you can cut back on, on other parts of the construction, the more you can work on, on the more expensive parts of it. And like with just about everything, you could buy different levels, the same house with different, different, uh, 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 um, different outfits different outfitting. So you could buy it with the deluxe plumbing package that actually had indoor plumbing, or you could buy it with, with, without plumbing. Uh, you could uh, buy it with central heating, or you could buy it with a, a furnace with floor vents. Um, you could uh, buy it with the nice sinks or the simple sinks. You could buy, the, uh, buy it with gas lights up until a certain point that it's only electrical. And then after that, you could buy the, the functional lighting or you could buy the fancy lighting. And so you would, you would, would tailor make this. Some of them came with, uh, you could order a matching garage. Um, some of them were, um, had other options that you could, you could take. And so you could customize uh, your house before you got it delivered. Um, you could build it on a slab. You could build it um, uh, on a raised uh, platform, uh, or you could build it uh, over a basement. Usually the basements had to be pre-dug by, by contractors, but other than that, it was pretty much a, a do-it-yourself um, job. Musical instruments, pianos, guitars, trumpets, trombones, clarinets, saxophones, zithers. Uh, you could buy all of those from Sears. In fact, some of the best uh, guitars electric guitars in the in 1950s are actually silver tone. Uh, I rebuilt one a few years ago for a friend and it was just a sweet, 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 sweet guitar. Um, it, it was it was one of the best. But here, like I said, you want to buy a piano, go online or I mean, go to your, your, your uh, Sears wish book and order yourself a uh, piano. Uh, how about um, 
tombstones. Now, I, I always get a weird reaction from people when they see this, but I, I got to tell you, when both my stepfather and my mother died, um, the I priced tombstones here. Of course, tombstones now are just those little flat slabs. They're not these nice, big, fancy things. Uh, and they were ridiculous. And I went online, and for about half the price, I got custom-made tombstones delivered to the cemetery and installed by the cemetery, just as, as any other stone would have been installed, um, for a fraction of the price. So uh, it may seem a little strange you're ordering uh, tombstones, but uh, we still do it. And Sears really was the um, seller of just about everything. Uh, on the left hand of your screen, you'll see the police equipment. I mean, you used to be able to order from Sears even into the 70s and 80s chickens and uh, other livestock that would be sent through the mail. It would mail live chickens. But here you could get different types of um, handcuffs if you're into that, a rosewood club if you needed one, um, you know, either, either for your sexual proclivities or if you were a, a local law enforcement or, wanted, or a wannabe local law enforcement, you could buy uh, handcuffs and that type of thing here. Next to that is the Heidelberg electric belt. This is for uh, gentlemen uh, who are, are experiencing um, a uh, waning of certain uh, essential um, vigor. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's an erectile dysfunction belt is what it is. And it, it's basically uh, sending a charge through your junk. Um, I don't know if it may, if it works. I would never try one. But uh, it's supposed to um, give off up to 40 gauge, uh, 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 you know, 60 gauge. You're talking, you know, a fair amount of static electric or um, um, direct current running through your uh, self uh, with this device. Um, my, the worst part about this whole thing, though, is that um, you can uh, return it for a full refund if you're unsatisfied. What do they do with the used ones? I mean, are they like, I don't know. Well, we'll just leave it at that. I mentioned earlier the uh, uh, Nickelodeons, the, the cheap movie theaters. And here's an early one. Uh, this is actually the Theater Unique. It's in, in New York City. It's a vaudeville house, not a movie palace. Uh, but it was photographed in 1908. And again, this is where, uh, where the common people... Did. And I, what I love about it is how fancy it is. Right? The movie palaces of the 30s that were built, 20s and 30s, were opulent. They were just luxurious because it was a way for poor people, for working class people, for middle class people to go and surround themselves with opulence and beauty and, and uh, gold leaf and thick carpets and beautiful drapes and murals and fancy lighting and, and all the stuff that they couldn't afford themselves but they could go spend a couple of hours, and, and really it was usually like three or four hours, uh, uh, whether it was going to a vaudeville house like this or whether it was going to a motion picture theater. Another group that has, uh, that sees a lot of changes at this particular age is, is women, especially women in the cities. And we, especially young, single women. Now, an earlier generation had seen opportunities for women in the factories, in the textile factories of, of Lowell, Massachusetts, and, and those types of places. By the time we get to the teens, and uh, by the time we get to the teens and, and start leaning towards the 20s, we're seeing uh, l new economic opportunities for working women. And working women are beginning, I don't mean working, not working girls, but working women. Uh, where they really become a symbol of the modern woman. We're talking about women working as secretaries, as shop clerks, as these are not high paid jobs. These are not even uh, uh, all that crucial jobs. Uh, there's still many women working as, as domestics and that type of thing, but there's this, this growing lower middle class of shop clerks and secretaries and file clerks and people like that, people who are learning new skills like typing is a huge thing. If you can type, suddenly your, your, your employability goes up two or three notches. Learning shorthand so you can take dictation, same thing. So there's some, there are skills 
that women are able to acquire that then um, uh, helps them move in really much more of an independent life. Um, they still don't have the vote. They won't get that until the 20s. Um, but it, 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 has a, uh, it has opportunities that never existed before. Now, there is a, a stratification within these jobs that women work. Normally, those things in the service industry, um, uh, primarily things like cleaning and maintenance and things like that, those are, those, the women that are in those jobs tend to be either racially or ethnically not white. Whereas waitresses and shop girls and secretaries uh, do tend to be white, and they tend to not be immigrants. They tend to be um, white native uh, um, uh, Americans, uh, and yeah, it's kind of the way it goes. Uh, the Charlotte Perkins. Uh, Char Charlotte Perkins Gilman writes a, a book called Women in Economics, which actually uh, demonstrates just how crucial women be have become by the time we get to the teens and the 20s as an aspect of, uh, of, of American industrialization, that they are a crucial part, that they are part of the economy, and that both as consumers and as um, uh, workers. And another thing that happens is now you have these women most of them single, many of them living in, living in women-only hotels or living in apartments, uh, uh, even apartment buildings would be segregated by gender. Um, the, uh, often with roommates, usually people they work with. Uh, and there be, we begin to see um, women doing things that they wouldn't have thought to do just 10 years before, things like going to the movies uh, without a male escort, um, two or three women going together. And I still didn't go that much into into bars. Uh, women that went into bars were um, considered B girls, bar girls, prostitutes, uh, or at least women of, of of very loose virtue. Whereas, so if you wanted to buy booze and you were female, you, many places had uh, a window that went behind the bar. You'd go out to an alley and you'd you'd order from because you couldn't go inside. Um, yeah, you know, just it, it, that's the way our country was. Um, that will change with prohibition. Uh, but so you have women with disposable income. They're buying stuff. They're part of the economy. They're also they're, they're, they are uh, moving away from being dependent on males for uh, their own identity and their own because they have their own money. They have their own ability to pick their own uh, entertainments and um, to travel and to do all kinds of things. They still are second-class citizens. They don't have the right to vote. They can't own real property in most states. They can't get a loan uh, by themselves in most states. Um, things will get better. But this is some of the earliest, really, uh, underpinnings of what will, will lead to the vote and then will lead to improving rights and then continue to lead to women tr still trying to get equal rights. One of the things that comes out of uh, industrialization and the urban age is um, uh, is Henry Ford. Henry Ford is uh, a racist son of a bitch. Uh, he is one of Hitler's uh, idols. Um, Hitler actually credits Henry Ford as his um, uh, inspiration for his anti-Semitism. He will award Henry Ford the German cross, the highest uh, 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 medal that a civilian can get in Germany. But he did two things here in this country that are very, very important on a positive side. I mean, his negatives far outweigh his positives as far as I'm concerned. But he does solidify the idea of the uh, conveyor belt, of, the, of the, um, the way to produce through um, individuals just doing one job, right? I put one bolt in, that one moves on, I put the same bolt in the next car and you, and you move on. That production line is really uh, an invention of Ford. The second thing that he did was 
unlike his competitors, he felt that it was important to pay his uh, workers a living wage. He didn't refer to it as such. That term will come in a little bit later. But he, his idea was that his employees needed to be sufficiently well off to be able to be able to infor, uh, afford the products that they make. Now, under capitalism, if you are not in a slave society, the wages you pay your workers are just a cost of goods sold. And so, by definition, under capitalism, a true capitalist would believe that wages should be kept as low as possible so that I don't have to add, so that it doesn't hit into my profit. That I can sell it for a reasonable price and still make a significant profit because my cost of goods sold is kept low. That is the definition of capitalism. That's why we are in the situation that we're in. That's why the recent tax bill passed by the Republicans in 2017 was all about giving money to the rich and taking money from the middle class and the poor. Because that's the other view of capitalism. That's the true view of capitalism. Those at the top get everything. The rest of us don't. Henry Ford actually tried to change that. Now, he did hire um, immigrants. Now, he didn't hire people of color. He didn't hire Jews, but he did hire immigrants. He will talk about at different times Americanization projects that he was involved in with, with that tried to help assimilate immigrants. Um, but he, like I said, he and, and, and his other entrepreneurs at the time, his other, other industry leaders at the time were, were, were aghast and appalled by this notion that you would pay your workers so much money. But it actually worked. Um, uh, it, because you know Ford's first customers, in some many respects, were his employees, and um, it made him very very popular. This allowed him to attract good labor, skilled labor. Um, it also ties that notion of mass production and mass consumption. Um, it's not part of the capitalist model, but. The, 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 he understood the links between production and consumption better than a lot of his peers. Um, and then he made that extension on, on wages beyond that. So the assembly line, yes, here is, uh, this is from 1915. This is a, a Highland Park, Michigan factory, part of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, and here you see these guys are are basically bolting the upholstery into the carriage. Uh, the, the padded seat is, is, is there, and the main part of the body of the car is there, and they're hooking it together. So you can see and it just moves down the line, and, and each person, as you get there, they put it together. So much so that by 1927, when this um, uh, uh, picture was taken, this is, is going into the, you can see they're all being funneled into uh, the Holland Tunnel. That's why the, all these cars are converging. And this is a, a link between New Jersey and New York. But you can, if you look at this, you'll see that probably 80% of these vehicles are Model T Fords. Now, there's the old joke about, oh, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Not true. The earliest models, you couldn't even buy a black one. You could get them in blue and green and yellow and a, a rusty red color. Um, but you couldn't get them black until almost until late in the 1920s when you could first get them in black. During the war, I believe they were all black. But prior to uh, World War I, uh, you could get any color you wanted as long as it was the four colors that they, that they automatically offered. Cars were all the rage in the new century. They accelerated life and caused chaos in the cities. A new century is beginning. The new century bowls people over with even quicker and even newer things. And so finally, I just want to kind of touch a little real quick summary here at the end of this section. Um, really, it becomes, by the time we get to the 1920s, uh, we really have reached a point where one of the ways that American feels free is the ability to live well. Mass consumption, mass production, the availability 
globally, I mean, not globally, but nationally, regardless of where you are in the United States, having access to really any product and lots and lots of jobs being created because of the in industrial work, uh, the expansion into the West. All of this stuff is is creating a a mass consumer and mass consumption and mass production uh, society. And, and some of these uh, will actually lead to uh, some potential solutions to some of these problems of, of inequality of wealth and, and, and that type of thing. Some of the things that come out of this are uh, really the critique of the corporate monopoly, you know, the, the, the robber barons, the, the big companies with so much political power because of their economic power, the uh, advancement of unions. You, we'll see over the next couple of decades, we'll see the rise of unionism in this country. And uh, we'll see Fordism extended by Father John Ryan, a Catholic priest who was a very, very well-read and very well-known uh, celebrity of his his era, uh, where he starts talking about a living wage that 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 minimum wages are are fine, but uh, that that people should be able to, if they have a job, if they work regularly, if they work hard, they should at least, at a minimum, be able to generate a living wage. And this is really the beginning of the living wage movement, which we s continue to see today. The, f the 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 movement for fifteen is the same. Uh, uh, response to the same problem. We've got goods available. We've got the rich getting really rich. But the rest of us, our wages haven't followed. And so, uh, you know, the, the, those, the wealthy want to keep our wages low to keep uh, the, 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 their costs down. Uh, but there's a movement to try to bring those wages back up so that at least we get to get part of that uh, economic uh, uh, boom, That especially since after our crash in 2007, most of us have not recovered at all. The wealthy have recovered, is, as one would say, hugely. Uh, the rest of us are still trying to get there, and that's why there's a push for uh, moving the minimum wage from $10.25, which is what it currently is, to that uh, $15 range, which would then almost make it possible for uh, someone working a 40-hour week at a minimum age, wage job would actually be able to afford uh, an apartment. Uh, there currently is no state in the union that uh, universally someone working for minimum wage can afford to rent a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, here in 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 uh, the central California and in, in not in the coast, but here in in the the, the valleys, um, it's better. You can make it function, maybe, uh, but uh, most places in the country you can no longer af afford one salary uh, with minimum wage to even be able to put a roof over your head. And that wraps up part one. The next one we'll pick up with the next part of the progressive era. <laughs>